it's got one of the sheets, your word for today is freedom. Well, freedom has been a topic that's been uh, on our minds recently, I think, through this year. We've had, a, certainly in my lifetime, an unprecedented uh, taking away of freedom for a good reason, because of coronavirus going through. And now as we're going out again, we've got more freedom. And one of the questions is, what do we do with that freedom? How do we best use it? And in one way, you could say that the whole of the letter to the Galatians is about freedom. It comes up as early as chapter 2, that Paul says some people came to the city to spy on the freedom that they have in Christ. And we've spent a little bit of time in our series on Galatians thinking about the freedom that we have as Christians. That the main part that Paul is trying to get across to us is that we are free from the Old Testament law. The Galatians are trying to put themselves under the law, and Paul has repeatedly says, no, you are free from the law. Now, there are two parts to freedom. One is the thing that you're free from, but the other is what you're free for. So far in Galatians, Paul has been talking about what we're free from, and in chapter 5, he changes and starts talking about what we are free for. The question is, if we're free from the law, then, then what now? And he's got two main things, and these are the two things we're going to look at. Jesus has set us free for freedom. So stand firm in that freedom. And secondly, Jesus has set us free to love, so walk in the Spirit. He's got two, two, uh, two different uh, images there. One's standing, one is walking. And so first we're going to look at Jesus has set us free for freedom, so stand. Now, I don't know if you found the, uh, the first part of that reading a bit of uh, an obvious statement. Chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Is, it, is that not a bit of an obvious point? I mean, what, what else are you setting people free for? For freedom Christ has set us free. But, but I think that's kind of the point. Paul, at this moment, talking to the Galatians, has been reduced to stating the obvious. Of course it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. If through faith in Jesus you've been set free, and free from the law, why would you go back under it? That's what he asked when we looked at chapter 4 last week. And so there's one very clear application for the Galatians and for us if we've been set free for freedom, and that is that we should stand firm in freedom. That's the second half of verse 1. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Freedom from the Old Testament law through faith in Christ is something that we need to hold on to. We need to stand firm in. We need to rebuff attacks against it. Why? Well, Paul gives us some reasons why. He's got a few here in the first part of chapter 5. The first reason is that if we add requirements on top of Jesus, it takes us away from Jesus. So, uh, starting from verse 2, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you here that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. See, the problem of adding something we have to do on top of faith in Jesus is that if we do that, we're no longer trusting in Jesus, we're trusting in what we do. To go under the Old Testament law is not just to add an extra thing on top of Christ, it's to walk away from Christ. To go to righteousness through our own works is not just to have an extra layer on top of grace, it's to fall away from grace. You, you know that saying? Somebody's fallen from grace. This is where they come from. Galatians chapter 5, where the Galatians are going under the law and are falling away from the grace that is theirs in Jesus. So let's look at the first reason to stand firm. Because if we add requirements on top of Jesus, that 
actually takes us away from Jesus. Secondly, Paul says, we need to stand firm because what matters is faith expressing itself through love. So this, this is verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. See, the whole issue in Galatians comes up because the Galatians think they need to be circumcised to be properly righteous. They need to go under the Old Testament law and fulfil those things. Paul says that is completely not right. It actually takes them away from Jesus. And there's this strange dynamic where circumcision, Paul says, is actually a nothing. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. That makes no difference at all. But if you make it something, then suddenly you're going away from Jesus. So what matters is if we trust in Jesus, if we have a faith that acts in love, which we'll get onto in a moment. If we put something else on top of Jesus, then we take away from faith in Jesus. The third thing is that the gospel of faith in Christ that brings freedom from the law is actually a message that is to be obeyed. Have, have a look with me at verse 7. Paul says to the Galatians, who started off well, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. See, the false Christians that have come into Galatia and who are demanding people obey the Old Testament law to be righteous, they look kind of obedient, don't they? In, in fact, they might look super obedient. Not only are they trusting in Jesus, but they're obeying the law as well. That looks amazing. But Paul says they're not obedient, actually. They're disobedient. They have disobeyed the truth. They've disobeyed the truth of the gospel that Jesus has died for our sins, is now risen to life, and is offering forgiveness to all who trust in him, simply by trusting him. That's the gospel of salvation, being saved from our sin, and of justification, of being declared righteous by faith alone. And the legalists in Galatia just don't believe it. They don't believe the gospel. And Paul says they will be held to account for that. Verse 10. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who has thrown you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. The gospel is something not just to know, but to obey. And fourthly, there's a reason we need to stand firm. It's because there will be opposition. Verse 11. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. If they're into cutting things off, why not go the whole way and cut more off? That's what Paul thinks of these people. See, the, Jesus' death on the cross is an offence to legalists. And notice why. This is kind of funny. Notice why it's, a, why it's an offence. It's not because Jesus' death on the cross makes following Jesus too hard. It's because the cross makes following Jesus too easy. As soon as you put your trust in Jesus, God declares you to be not guilty. He gives you the righteousness of Jesus. You're not righteous because of what you do. You're righteous because of what Jesus has done for you. And the legalists look on that and think that is terrible. Think about what that means. That means that anyone could turn to Jesus and be forgiven no matter what awful thing that they've done. Well, yes, it does. That's outrageous. Well, yes, it is. But that is the heart of the Christian faith. The outrageous, completely unmerited, free and forever forgiveness 
for anyone who puts their trust in Jesus. There was always going to be opposition to the gospel of salvation by faith in Christ alone, not because it's too difficult, but precisely because it's too easy, because it lets anyone in, because it lets me in, it lets the people that I look down on in, it lets anyone in who simply repents and turns to Jesus. Now, it could be that one of the fears that the legalists in Galatia have is that if we're actually genuinely free from the law, justified by faith in Christ alone, well then, people will just go and do anything, right? Christians will just go and do any old sin. We'll turn into massive sinners who just do whatever we like. And so that's what Paul turns to next. Jesus has set us free for freedom, so we need to stand firm in that freedom. Secondly, Jesus has set us free to love, so we need to walk in love by the Spirit. See, if we're genuinely free from the law, what is it that's going to stop us going off and being pretty horrible people? Paul says we're free from the law, he says it here again. But then he says we have a choice to make about how we use that freedom. There's a good choice and there's a bad choice. What Paul says is that Christian freedom must be used to love. Verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. There it is again. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So it's here that Paul starts setting up this, this battle within a Christian. It's between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh, I think, means the part of us that's in rebellion against God, that doesn't do what he wants. And you, you get a bit of an idea of what the, what the flesh does. Down in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions envy, drunkenness, orgies, etc. Paul says we're not to use our freedom to do that. Our freedom is not for sin, it's for love. And specifically he says it's for serving one another in love. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. Now there's an interesting thing going on here. The word Paul uses for serving is actually the word that's used for slaves serving. And so we're set free from slavery to the law. We're free. But from that freedom, we willingly go and make ourselves slaves of others. Not that they own us, but that we serve them in love. And not only is that kind of love good, it actually fulfills the law. So here's the irony. Paul says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. More literally, he says the entire law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbour as yourself. And here's where he twists the, what the Galatians are thinking and puts it on their head. He says, if you pursue righteousness by the law, well, you'll be under the curse of the law. But if you're set free from the law, through faith in Christ, and your faith expresses itself in love for others, you fulfil the law. So the way to fulfil the law is not by going under the law, but being released from it, by having faith in Jesus. So Paul says in Romans chapter 13, let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever love other, loves others has fulfilled the law. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. If you really want to fulfil the law, then trust in Jesus and use your freedom from the law to love others. So it could be that the Galatians are worried about what you might call licentiousness, that is, going and doing whatever sin you like because you're free from the law. 
And it seems like to combat that, they're turning to legalism instead, putting themselves under the law. But Paul has another way in time. Neither licentiousness nor legalism, but love. Not a midway between the two, but a thing that is completely different. Because love takes freedom and uses it for good, doesn't it? It doesn't use our freedom from the law to be selfish or to gratify our flesh that's opposed to God. Love takes our freedom and serves people. It builds them up. It does what's good for other people. And this might be reading behind Galatians a little bit, but it seems like they might be lacking a bit in love. Have a look at verse 15. If, if you bite and devour each other, watch out that you will be destroyed by each other. And down in verse 26 as well, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. It seems like actually the Galatians are in a bit of a mess. And the Galatians are thinking that what they're lacking is perhaps small law. But Paul says what they're lacking is not law, but faith expressing itself in love. Now, you could ask, what's going to help us to actually do that? If, if we are free, genuinely free as Christians from the law, what's going to help us to actually go and do that? Because I'm pretty sure on my own that I would just go off and use my freedom to please myself. What's going to help us to use our freedom to love people rather than be sinful? Because it seems like the law would be a top candidate for that, right? You can imagine the Galatians. You want to restrain sin. You want people to love. Paul, we've got the answer. It's the law. That's what you need. But Paul says that's not the way. Christians are free from the Old Testament law. We're not under it. So what's going to make us love? Paul says it's not the law. It's the Spirit. He says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's Paul's solution, because it's God's solution. God puts out His Spirit in us to guide us so that we know what's good and actually be empowered to do what's good. And Paul says, Our job is to keep up with the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit. Or as he says down in verse 25, to keep in step with the Spirit. Now, it's true that there will be this kind of battle going on between the Spirit and our fleshly selves. So Paul says that in verse 17, he paints the picture, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. It's a bit of an unfortunate translation at the end of that sentence. A more accurate, accurate translation, this is from the Christian Standard Bible, would be, they're in conflict with each other so that you don't do what you want. It's describing the battle that's going on. There is a conflict in Christians where, yes, the flesh is at work and the spirit is also at work. But it is not an intractable battle. It is not a battle of yin and yang, where they both need each other and that just goes on and on. No, the Spirit is superior. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you do what the Spirit desires, you won't live to please yourself. You'll live to please God instead. So that's the choice we've got to make. It's not between the flesh and the law but between keeping in step with the flesh and keeping in step with the spirit. I reckon it's useful at this point to go and look at a little bit of what Paul says in another letter in, in Romans. You might have noticed, if you're familiar with Romans, that there are lots of parallels with Galatians as we've been going through. Let me read to you a little bit from Romans chapter 8, where Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit. He says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. 
The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It seems to me that Paul has no confidence in all, at all, in the law to produce righteousness. But he has enormous confidence in the Spirit. And in fact, he's got enormous confidence in Christians because of the Spirit. This is back in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We're going to have a look at, at next week at those lists of behaviours that Paul brings up. But to some summarise, you could say that those who don't trust in Jesus and don't have the Spirit, and just continue going after the acts of the flesh, well, that's a road to not being in God's kingdom. But for those who do have faith in Jesus, we are given the Spirit. And it is the Spirit that both sets us free and causes us to use our freedom to do good, to love and serve. You could say that it's the Spirit that makes the gospel of righteousness by faith alone actually work. Because Jesus sets us free from the law, not to be just to left on our own with our fleshly desires, but to be led by God himself through the Spirit. That is why the gospel of faith in Christ actually changes people. Because it comes with God's Spirit. I take it that means that we can then share in Paul's confidence confidence that we can live righteously because that confidence is not actually in us but in the work of God the Father through his Son Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and that's why I think the gospel of faith alone ends up being the gospel of the glory of God alone. because the Christian life from start to finish is God's work through Jesus through his Spirit to his glory that's what the Christian life is like. I reckon this chapter is like Paul popping up the bottom on the Christian life so we can see inside and see how it all works. And what we find is that it's not law that drives us. It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit that produces love and uses our freedom to drive our life of love. That is what the Christian life is like. Not slaves to the law, not trusting in our own righteousness to our own glory, but free from the law, wonderfully free, and in our freedom empowered by the Spirit to the glory of God. That's why I think this chapter is an important chapter for us in Galatians, because it not only shows us what we are free from, it shows us what we are free for. Jesus has set us free from the law to go and do things. He set us free from the war for freedom, and so we need to stand firm in the freedom that the gospel brings. Don't let anybody take that from you. Don't let anybody pile up requirements on top of Jesus. But secondly, Jesus has set us free to walk by the Spirit in life. And so keep in step with the Spirit. Love people and do the good things that the Spirit enables you to do. And next week, 
we'll have a clearer picture, go and look at those lists and see what life by the Spirit actually looks like. Let me pray for us. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we have been set free from the Old Testament law. Father, we thank you for the freedom we have in Christ. We thank you for the enabling of your Spirit. And we ask, Father, that you would work in us this week so that we might love and serve you and your people. And we pray that we might do that freely, motivated by your love for us, empowered by your Spirit, so that we might please you and not ourselves. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.